This week's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have, life can be pretty damn hard, and without a healthy mind, it's even harder. Check out online therapy with betterhelp.com slash awful and be on your way to a little more ease. And this is where we get my best worst. We get to see the little tiny boat. <laughs> oh my God. They're trying so hard for drama here, and it is though they gave us the little tiny boat scenes to insert in case there were ever going to be stakes, right? He's like, <laughs> no, honey, come back. Toodaloot, toodaloot. rub a dub dub three men in a tub. My daughter, I'll never get feed and make the wee. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. It's so funny. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because somehow that remains a job. I'm your host, No Illusions, and unfortunately, Heath won't be able to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm fantastic, Noah. It's been years in the making, but finally, finally, I know how the other side of heaven's story concludes. Right. No, it was keeping me up at night as well. <laughs> now, in honor of this movie, we thought about actually bringing on a Pacific Islander as a guest. But if this movie has taught us anything, it's that their opinions are best told by white men who speak on their behalf without their consent or input. So it's just going to be the two of us today. Yeah. Yeah. Turns out Heath just tricked us into sending him to Fiji. So mm -hmm. tell us, Noah. <laughs> What will we be breaking down today? We watched The Other Side of Heaven 2, Fire of Faith. So in the first movie, a heartless church endangers a naive young man with a negligent mission of colonialism. And now it's time for him to do that with his kids. Yeah. <laughs> the problem was he wasn't a baby enough in the first right, movie. Right, exactly. So, Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love the white savior narrative of the first film... But I went there, I didn't belong, and I got sick was too gripping a plot for you. <laughs> you will love this movie. It's extending my boring story of my vacation so you'll buy me another drink. The movie. Isn't it, though? <laughs> Isn't it? it would, it's hilarious because, like, the first one, you could it was boring, but you could at least see how it made a movie. This one, not so much. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, for newer listeners and those who insufficiently memorize our back catalog, can you catch everybody up on the important goings-on from the first one? Okay, first of all, rude. You need to be caught up. We watched 317 Christian movies for you. Get on board. Right. All right, first one. White guy goes to Tonga. That is it. You're caught yep. up. No, that was. Um, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> and Anne Hathaway was in the first movie. Yep. But she told them to fuck themselves for this one, which, fun fact, is in the IMDb trivia for this film. Yeah. Well, no, I love the way they phrased it. They said that she was uh, outside of the movie's budget because of her career afterwards. And I'm like, well, sh she told you that it would take all the money in the world, which was more than your budget allowed yeah. for. But, so, yeah, technically, that's true. So is there anything you want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Best worst doctor. Okay. So look, the island of Tonga does not have the resources is pretty much the entire plot of this movie. But the doctor at the hospital on the island of Tonga will literally do only this throughout the movie. He'll walk over, see someone with a medical condition and be like, you guys got magic prayer powers, right? Because I, yeah, I don't. I don't absolutely <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it gets worse and worse as we go. And I was gonna go with best worst tiny little boat. Oh yeah. So there's a part of this movie where this guy is negligently taking his children on this boat and put them in terribly unsafe conditions and everything. And they're going from one island to another, and there's a big storm, and they have to keep subbing in this miniature boat. And it's just, you can see the rounded Fisher Price edges on it and everything. It's just such a silly little tiny boat. But it's hilarious. And we'll get there. But between now and then, we've got basically a whole movie of skippable scenes. So we're going to pause for a quick break while we decide which ones to bother with. But we'll be back in a minute with all the doldrums that are The Other Side of Heaven 2, Fire of Faith. Hi, welcome to a typical cereal buying experience. I'm Todd. How can I help you? I mean, 
How typical could the experience be if you're here to help me? It's an audio medium, kind of hard to pull off without an imaginary serial salesman, so... Fair enough. Okay, so maybe you can help me. I'm trying to find stuff that isn't overloaded with sugar and carbs, but my husband won't eat anything that doesn't have a cartoon mascot. Do you have anything like that? Is, I'm sorry, is your husband an adult, or... Yeah, yeah, I, I mean... Technically, yes. Well, I'm sorry, but despite having a dedicated aisle that sprawls out before you, like the closing scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark, we really only have Twig and Bramble, Frosted Chocolate Sugar Flakes, and Frosted Chocolate Sugar Flakes with marshmallows. Really? In this whole aisle? I mean, we just shape them different. Oh, so nothing that's delicious and healthy. No, no. For that, you're going to have to try Magic Spoon. What's... Magic Spoon. Well, Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories per serving as well. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. Wow, those are a lot of descriptors. And most of them are meaningful. Plus, with Magic Spoon, you get to build your own box. Available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, cinnamon, and returning favorites, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. Yum, they sound delicious. They sure are. And they're so healthy that you can finally have a guilt-free late-night bowl of cereal. All right, I'm in. How do I get Magic Spoon? Just go to magicspoon.com slash gam to grab a custom bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code GAM at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it'll be backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash gam and use the code gam to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Wait, uh, Magic Spoon can hear you? Well, I, I mean, yeah, it's in the copy, and I couldn't think of a way to fit it into the theme of the ad without turning them into a shadowy Illuminati-like omnipresent cereal cabal, so... Yes? Weird. John Groberg, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, now, that lady I met in the hallway, who's, whose wife was that? Oh, uh, no, John, that's that's one of the producers. Of, of babies. Uh, of the movie? Oh, like a like a porno movie? No, thank you. I. Uh... Uh, you know what? Let's just move on. John, it's been 10 years since the smash hit, based on your life, The Other Side of Heaven. Boy, howdy, how time flies. Yeah, and you know, all these years you've been telling us about how much more there is to the story. Yeah, um, can you ask your wife to bring me a coffee, please? Literally just told you she's a producer. With John. milk, just, uh, like little milk in it. So Splash. we finally raised the $10 million you told us we needed to make this movie, and so we are ready to hear it. Uh, what, Hear what? The second half of your story. The one you've been telling us about for 10 years? Oh, right. No, <laughs> yeah, right. That last movie was not at all a ploy to meet Anne Hathaway. I'll tell you uh, that. Oh, so, uh, so one time I was on the island and my, my kid got really sick. My son, that sucked. Um, one of the. One of the brown ones, dads got mad at him once. I'm sorry, John, is is this the second half of the story that you've been waiting 10 years to make? Well, now, to be fair, that's twice as many things already as happened in the whole first movie. Yeah, you know what? That's true. Okay, so I have a quick question for you. Are you one of my sons? I hate you so much. So yes, then. And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up on this movie's only twist. It was rated PG-13. In retrospect, I have no goddamn idea why. <laughs> I was going to say, now I'm looking for the one fuck you get to keep it PG-13. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So strap in, Mormons. We're going to get a bit racy here. Mm-hmm. And speaking of Mormons, we're going to learn that this was produced by BYU TV. Yep. This is a real miraculous network with its own app don't worry i'm already deep deep within <laughs> the rabbit hole of byu tv finding us future material it's so sad that we found out this late into mormon movie month but uh, <laughs> yeah so so john or as you may remember him from the first one coley pokey grobert catches us up on the first movie he reminds us that uh, he went to to Tonga, and then he married a recast Anne Hathaway. <laughs> <laughs> In the IMDb trivia, 
along with being like Anne Hathaway told us to fuck themselves, they have this great moment where they're like, but the actress who replaced her is from New Zealand. Pretty exotic. That's pretty good, too. <laughs> Almost a hobbit. Not sure if you're... Uh... And I'll tell you what, even if you didn't know it going in, she does actually a pretty good job with the accent most of the time, but once in a while, she's pretty New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> it does does slip through. It's like she's being slowly overtaken by Ray Comfort's ghost. Yeah, it's unsettling. <laughs> and what's amazing about this opening montage, right, is we need to get are like straight-laced Mormon missionary from teenager to full-grown adult with four children. Yeah. Uh -huh. But we've got to do it in a way that won't piss off a Mormon audience. So, like, when they're talking about the 1960s, he's like, those rock and rollers were sure excited about their music. Oh, so I had to, I had to write down the fucking quote because this is the Mormonist description of anything ever. Here's how he describes hippies. He says, there was an exuberant rock and roll counterculture. <laughs> <laughs> really gave it 110% those rock and rollers. Yeah, so in his summary of the 1960s, he also points out that he was totally down with civil rights despite spending that entire time evangelizing for a church that wouldn't let black people join as priests until 1978. Yeah, also... Hey, John, the only way you need to not blow this little introduction here is to compare Martin Luther King to the only other people of color. You know, Martin Luther King is like the Tongans. <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote in my note, really, movie? Really? So you you just, kept that? Okay. And then as he's doing this, there's these drums rising slowly in the background, but they're doing it so slowly and so erratically that I had to keep pausing the movie to see if something was like, dripping onto my roof or something <laughs> but ultimately we 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 get some traditional tongan music i'm assuming mm -hmm. and it comes up and gives us the title screen the other side of heaven to fire of faith well it's actually dumber than that it comes up fire of faith is our post colonic well yeah right the other side of heaven <laughs> we should have gone the other direction with that my bad <laughs> So and then we get this weird ass establishing shot of both the Fijian jungles, which is where they filmed this, and some Midwestern strip mall in the dead of winter. Yeah, I do not know why, but constantly throughout this film, it will contrast hardworking Tongans struggling to get by with the poverty created by the white saviors who are there simply to convert them to their team in the religion battle and white people being like, I'll have another peeled grape, please. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So one of these locations is having a hoedown. Now, contextually, we know that it's the Idaho one, but given the way that this film presents it, it's just anybody's guess. This could be a Tongan <laughs> hoedown. Yeah, at first, I watched this whole scene the first time I watched this movie being like, wait, is there like a white people part of Tonga where they're having a dance while all the Tongans <laughs> right. do the work? <laughs> so, yeah, but I, I get what you're saying. The, the, the shots of Tonga here had a like... They're just showing these shots of extraordinary poverty, but through the lens of like, isn't that charming? It's so charming <laughs> the way that they have to do it there. Oh, they must love to farm that way without any equipment. Yeah. Ah, just getting your hands in the soil. So our main character is dancing with all four of his daughters and his pregnant wife when the pregnant wife does a, a quick little prank to make him think that perhaps she's going to miscarry his child. Oh, Fun. Anna didn't play enough miscarriage based pranked on me when we were when she was pregnant with our son. Missed opportunities. Right. And I just want to point out this character will be pregnant so often in this fucking movie that this baby, the one she has not even given birth to yet will not be the baby we worry about in the movie. No, nope. this is the pre baby baby. Yeah, well, it's a Mormon story. So, yeah, they've got four kids at this point. By the end of the movie, I think they have seven. Yep. So, yeah. Whew. So, okay, so we get done with that scene. They're leaving that night. Everybody's calling each other bishop and sister and weird shit like that. Fucks me right up. I love the Mormon nicknames things because they've just taken all the Catholic stuff and they're like, oh, you know, that's Steve, the janitor. He's a pope. We'll just call him everyone. Everyone who's <laughs> your third uncle is your pope now. <laughs> 
And then so and we get outside of the car and there's this boring, stupid fucking moment where it's you can tell it's the writer going like, oh, there's that one time my wife said something kind of clever after that dance. And we so we shoehorned it into the stupid fucking movie. But really what we're lingering on is how much this actress is not Anne Hathaway. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the other thing is like. There was a love story and a conflict in the first movie, right? Remember, he wanted to be with the Tongan girl, but then he had Anne Hathaway back home. Right. But there's none of that here. So it's just like, I sure do love you. The first movie all resolved. Great. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they're driving home and he's decided to drive home without his headlights on because the moonlight is very pretty that night. And if you think to yourself, wait, doesn't he have his pregnant wife and four daughters in the car at this moment? You're correct. Get used to that running theme of the film. This is the riskiest car behavior that does not pay off in a truck hitting we've ever seen in Christian cinema. Right. right. The kids in the back might as well be singing. I like being alive. And yet they survived this drive. Yeah. Right. In any other Christian movie, somebody's dying on this ride home. <laughs> so, OK, so we cut to Tonga. And of course, the first people we meet are doing some kind of hard working dirt related activity there's a pig screeching in the background <laughs> the pig really steals the scene here i just want to he say does. the pig really yeah just chewing scenery becomes a much bigger character than i thought he was going to be to be honest mm -hmm. yeah so okay so we're going to meet sioni now sioni is the evil catholic reverend on this tongan island yeah and we're also going to meet Natani and his unnamed wife, who used to be Catholic, but they're going over to the Mormon side now. They've come to tell Sioni that they've been drafted. Yeah, we're we're Mormons now, but it's OK. We brought you an apology gift basket and pig. Yes, yes. And a pig <laughs> in a bag. Right. So, yeah, they, they have the awkward <laughs> reverend breakup, you know, yep. the, and they really do have the whole it's. It's not you. It's me moment and everything. <laughs> Sioni can't be consoled, but they say, but in honor of you and your church, we, we gave you like, you know, some coconuts and shit and this live pig in a bag. But Sioni doesn't want their coconuts and live pig in a bag. So he tells one of his sons to burn all the food and his other son, this is Tuatai, to throw the pig into the sea and drown it in its little bag. Yeah. Weird, unnecessary cruelty as a response to this gift. I just, I wanted to watch this guy in other contexts, like someone brings him an edible arrangement and he's waterboarding it for no reason. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to go out of our way to make Sioni into an evil motherfucker over and over again in this movie, even beyond like, like it doesn't actually do the script any favors, do the story any favors. It just makes him seem more like a savage. Yep. It's really poorly done. So anyway, so he tells his son to go drown the pig, but Tuatai can't bring himself to drown the poor little piglet. So he lets him go. And, and instead, he drowns some seaweed so that it looks good. OK, but this actor was not ready to be filmed doing this throw. It is so short. It is such a bad throw. It's like a foot and a half in front of him and very obviously filled with seaweed. Well, and, and straight up. That's the other yeah. thing is, yeah, he gets a lot of oomph on it, but it all goes straight up. There's seaweed falling out of it as he does it. And you could tell like they wanted to do it again, but they only had the one bag and he got it far enough out that nobody could get to it anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, so they had to go with that one. I wanted Minister Dad to come over and be like, you know what? I changed my mind. Let me let me get this pig and then it opens it up. Oh, I changed it to seaweed as a merpig. <laughs> Fuck. But yeah, but he lets the pig go. The pig runs back to Natani, the guy who just broke up with his reverend dad. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to this. I, I just love this scene so goddamn much. It's supposed to just be comic relief, but it's horrifying and terrible because this is a Mormon movie. It's the best. <laughs> so Bishop John Colipoki is counseling this cantankerous old couple that wants a divorce. Okay. But the Mormon version of cantankerous old couple is fucking who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> and he's just, yes. he's just like smirking at the fucking camera like Jim from the office while he's like, I'll beat you so badly you'll never walk again, you horrible <laughs> bitch. Do it now, cut off your cock like Lorraine Bobbitt, you son of an ass. <laughs> so that's the thing is that like from any non-Mormon perspective, you're just like, 
wow, this couple should really get divorced and try to enjoy the remaining years of their lives. <laughs> but it's Mormon. So we're just like, oh, that old Mrs. Johnson there. She sure hates her husband. <laughs> and then they vanish from the movie. Like, I just want to this. I don't know what this was supposed to establish, but they are gone from the movie now, even though they were more interesting than anything else that will happen in this film. Oh, I wanted their movie. I was hoping that this was like they were setting up a spinoff or something like that. Yes, uh, like the twits. No, it, got, it, it, it ends with her hitting him. <laughs> and there's just might as well be a fucking slide whistle. Yeah. Buster Keaton might as well pop up next to the guy when he gets back up again. Oh, God. Yeah, but of course, what we're supposed to be establishing here is that Coley Pokey sure is a good bishop. He can even keep this terribly miserable old couple from getting divorced. That's right. No losing points in the divorce column on this bishopry. Yeah. So they play for comedy, this just horrifying window into the world where divorce isn't allowed. And then we get a horrifying window into what it's like when women are made to be baby factories. When we cut to the pregnant mom trying to get dinner on the table for four kids, all younger than seven. Oh, man. Pretty. uh, How did it feel to watch this scene? Noah? did it feel good? Did it feel nice to to birth control the opening? Right. Yeah, exactly. And this scene essentially serves no purpose at all, right? So dad comes in, mom is haggard and and miserable. The dog gets in and starts eating the food off the table immediately. Yep. Which is a great fucking moment because the lead actor is supposed to like chase the dog but not get there in time. And so the dog gets on the table, but he goes too fast. And so he has to just sort of stand there and wait for the dog to start eating the food. And you're just like... Get the fucking dog, man. Why aren't you getting the dog? They're like, we trained the fucking dog to eat the fucking stew. The dog's going to eat the fucking stew. <laughs> Seems like he's standing there going, okay, well, let's see what he's going to do on the table. Maybe he's going to light the can. Nope, he's eating the stew. Okay, he's eating the stew. <laughs> and again, like, I'm not saying that there aren't other movies that have this opening of like, mommy, I want my dog. I'm on fire, right? Right, but like, yeah. Usually it's like, a, oh, life here is so crazy and bad. That is not the point of this scene. The point of this scene is we got a letter and we're going to Tonga. Right. They're just like, well, we should probably show a little bit of what a typical Mormon family is like. (laughs) Screams and hatred and a tired mother who's not getting any support. Right. Yeah, exactly. We are not establishing that she's too put upon or anything like that. Quite the opposite, actually. This is apparently supposed to be the dream for Mormon women. So, yeah, but then he gets a, a letter from... The Mormon church that's like, your ass is moving to Tonga for three years. Yeah, look, I know we've watched these movies a ton. It's always just so fucking wild to me that the Mormon church does this to people on the rank. Like, I don't know, for some reason, the sending the teenagers off to somewhere remote in the world is one thing. But the fact that they just occasionally show up at someone's house and they're like, hey, you live in France now. Right. With your whole fucking family. Right. You better work that out. We're not going to help at all. Bye. (laughs) Yeah. So he goes to Tonga because Mormonism owns him. Apparently, Mm -hmm. we have a useless ass scene of them in the airplane because this movie's got to be filled with some damn thing. (laughs) I'm surprised we didn't get them checking their baggage at this point. (laughs) Right. But to be clear, like, yes, he's bringing his kids to an underdeveloped disease place because his church told him to. Right. And, And again, The entire first movie was about how hard it was for him as a consenting teenager on this island. And now he's like, bringing my babies and my pregnant wife. Can't wait to get foot worms again. Well, right. Yeah. Just a quick reminder. If you don't remember episode 199, the big conflict in the like the act two conflict in this movie was all about rats eating the flesh off of his feet. Yep. On this island. Yes, it was. Yeah. So, okay. So we head back to Tonga with a couple more fucking poverty establishing shots yeah and this is where we get the scene in the market where pig freeing son gives a guy who's not catholic anymore the heads up that like hey um so you know how you live on the same island as my crazy bigot dad um i think he might kill you for leaving the church so move yeah, yeah. So that's Tuatai is the reverend's son who's warning Natani that he needs to get the fuck out of there because his dad don't want no filthy Mormon on his island. At one point he says, you got to move out of Tufua. And I wrote in my notes, maybe move to Impossible Burger Fua. <laughs> <laughs> 
their language is silly. That was Eli's joke. But yeah, so I thought it was excellent wordplay, Noah. How dare you? <laughs> so no, you do that to English too. So I guess it would be bigoted <laughs> not to make that joke. So yeah, exactly. Right. So okay. So Tuatai says to him, he's like, yeah, you know, hey man, you might want to move out quick while you still have a chance. Also, why the fuck did you become a filthy ass Mormon to begin with? Yeah. Right. Tuatai's pretty pissed. He's like, you. Sh-, he he literally says, and I quote. You shame our family and village by becoming a Mormon. And I'm like, well, I actually agree with it. Maybe I get there from a different direction, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. Have you seen their vials of oil, Matt? You know what? It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we move from that market scene to Coley Pokey and his family driving through town, right? They've arrived now. And basically, we just have this ill gross scene from the wife and the kids. Yeah. It's just the kids shouting out racism slash a misunderstanding of Tongan culture as they take like a fucking Jaws the Universal Ride tour of this town. Right. Well, and and the mom going like, oh, it's gross and poor, like the fucking Eli character from a <laughs> Zales ad. One of the little girls literally opens up this section by going, wow, daddy, everyone is brown. Yep. Yeah, that's actually a line there. So, okay, they get to their home, which is, you know, nice compared to where I live, where Eli lives. Every other fucking domicile we've seen on this island is like, you know, corrugated metal held together with twigs and shit. So they're moving to this gigantic fucking mansion. This movie sees nothing at all wrong with either that or all of the fucking native servants that are walking around their mansion. Okay. Thank you, Noah. We can talk about Invisible Black Lady. <laughs> there yes. is there is a black woman who will accompany them literally everywhere they go in the movie, and they will never, ever acknowledge her. She nope. doesn't get a name. Nope. They will simply hand her babies at various points in the film, and she will never be acknowledged in this movie about how hard it was for them on this island. Yeah. I just kept wanting the lady to be like turning to the camera and being like, yeah, these motherfuckers. I didn't even <laughs> sign up to be. I'm not a Mormon. I don't get to go somewhere else in three years either. <laughs> well, so I think she gets a name. But yeah, I don't think she has a single spoken line. I don't think anybody ever speaks to her in the movie. Yeah. So, yeah. So they get done with their big jello dinner and they have this moment like afterwards. They excuse the the older girls, let them run off and, and play. And they have this moment where all of the Mormons that were already on the island clearly want to tell John something, Coley Pokey something. Yeah. But they don't, you know, everybody else wants somebody else to have to do it. In my mind, there were so many fun things that this could be. <laughs> but it ends up being like one of them is it's just like, yeah, we 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 didn't realize that you had four kids and a pregnant wife. It, it, the medical care here is really bad compared to the states. We feel like you should just turn down this assignment. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 no. I was here with the foot rat eating earlier. Yeah, this is great. I, I, Don't I, I, worry about it. Yeah. My feet have been eaten by rats. I have an immunity. Yeah. So and I fucking Mormons. He says to these concerned folks, he says, I think sorry. He grabs his wife hand. We think it'll be fine. So that that's Mormon inclusivity for you. Remembering to tell your wife what she thinks what she at the thinks same too. time. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Also, this is where slicked hair guy will be introduced. And if you watch along with us and you are entirely confused about this guy's existence in the movie. <laughs> yes, yes. Let me explain it. This guy would eventually become the president of the Mormon church. And he was like in two scenes of this guy's life. And so they're like, well, we have to include the Mormon president, right? It's like you have to include when Forrest Gump meets JFK or whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So throughout the movie, this is the first scene where it happens. But throughout the movie, this guy will just show up and be like, hello, John, you know me. I know you. I'm in the movie. Right. Future president, whatever. My name. Like he was the fucking wacky neighbor making a reprise <laughs> or something. Yeah, he's Thomas Monson. And of course, they also it's hagiographical the way they present him. Right. Because every time he shows up, they have to go out of their way to establish what a swell fella he is. Right. And, <laughs> and because he serves no goddamn purpose in the movie, unless you know that you're just like I didn't until I looked it up afterwards. You're just confused at all shit as to why we're setting this guy up as a character. Yeah, each time this guy, unless you know who he is, each time this guy is in the movie will be more baffling than the last. Yeah. Yeah. So but 
Coley Pokey puts his foot down. He says, we're staying here. Otherwise, there's no plot at all. And you can tell it that he means it because there's a soft piano melody behind his speech. <laughs> so they all leave. The, the, the people that were having dinner with him, they leave. The little girls are outside jumping on gigantic cockroaches. Yeah. With their bare feet. Yep. It's just such a weird... It's a weird nightmare before Christmas interlude in this movie that never comes back. It's psychopathic, right? Yeah. They, they all walk out there and the, and the little girls are like, we're murdering living animals. Yeah, honestly, if the rest of the movie, the kids had just shown more and more psychotic behavior, I would have been in on it. <laughs> By the end of it, they've got a Tongan tied up in the background. <laughs> Start walking towards him slowly with surgical scalpels. Okay, okay. 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 Setting up uh, Other Side of Heaven 3. <laughs> so, yeah, but of course, and then as they're leaving, Thomas Monson stops and he's just like, I too will jump on bugs with you because I'm a fun loving character. <laughs> so again, the hagiography, but also just fucking gross. <laughs> I'm also in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that night, Tootai, the son of the reverend, sneaks off in the darkness to help the Mormons, Natani and his wife, move. Yeah. You know, because the Catholics are coming for him in the darkness or something. Mm hmm. I could barely tell what the fuck was happening. It was so it, it was so hard for me to piece that together that that's what was happening. I absolutely had to include that scene in the notes because, damn it, I'm not working that hard for nothing. Yeah, it's such a bad scene and so badly lit that it's going to get summed up two scenes from now. Right. Yeah, exactly. In case you couldn't tell what. We... <laughs> All right. So then we get John's first day of work where he's like trying to get his bearings. Right. And again, they're trying to capture the zest of the first film where it was like, you're the only missionary and we don't have this and that. But he's he's the president of the mission. So he's like, you're telling me I have to do the accounting and the bookkeeping. Well, right. Yeah. So they're trying to establish that he has all of these different responsibilities. He's like, so who's in charge of the finances? They're like, you are. Who's in charge of communicating with the government? You are. Who's in charge of building new chapels? You are. And then he's like, well, how am I going to have any time to do missionary work? And I'm like, none of that shit seems more than like an hour and a half a week type of shit. <laughs> I feel like you could do that on like Tuesday through Friday. <laughs> yeah, wanted one of the Tongans to hand him like a copy of Who Moved My Cheese. Oh, okay. I, 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 this. But yeah, so they go for that trope and miss it. And then we watch Sione's family eat. We have to summarize the sneaking off in the middle of the night scene, right? Yeah. And I like how the dad here is supposed to be driven into a murderous rage, but there's like there's no motivation or reason. So he's just like, oh, son, I was just uh, remembering some unspecified amount of time ago. Did you drown that pig like I told you to? Because I will be mad at you if you did not. Yeah. Yeah. The dad discovers that, A, that he helped Natani and his family disappear before dad could sick the Catholic army on him or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then he also found out that Tuatai didn't drown the pig like he asked. Yes, that is an actual plot point. <laughs> so dad gets all angry and shit and Tuatai does not make things better when he says well you're just afraid of how right the Mormons are about God and Jesus is what it is said no father to his son ever <laughs> yeah no there's a, there are several moments in this movie again that make no sense unless you remember that yeah you have to have something for the Mormons to stand up and say hoorah about right yeah so. exactly so, yeah, so, but Sione is pissed. So he's going to punish his, his son with something shovel related. That's all we know at the moment. It's so bizarre. We're going to get to it. It's the craziest part of this movie. Yeah. He says, get out there, grab the shovels. And we're like, wait, what the shovels? What are you going to do with the shovels? <laughs> and then we fucking cut to dad telling his daughter fucking Mormon bedtime stories. I'm like, get back to the shovels, motherfuckers. <laughs> Yeah. Although, to be fair, this scene is pretty much as terrifying as the shovel scene we're about to experience. He ends his story with they all lived happily ever after. Right. And she's like, oh, dad, how come you always do that? And he's like, oh, it's, it's better for you to have happy thoughts. And she's like, what about our dead cousin? Right. Can you think of a happy ending for that? And he's like, Ooh, when you die, you go to heaven. <laughs> yeah. Right. She's like, oh, I don't want all my stories to end. You know, I'm old. I can take some I can I, I can handle some dark shit now. Basically, I can handle some dark ending stories. I want you to murder some people off in the next one. OK, 
And I'm thinking to myself, this is it, right? Like last time we saw her, she was murdering bugs and now she wants her stories to end with the fucking, you know, with the <laughs> princess dying in the night, throwing himself off the fucking tower or something. <laughs> yeah, it's escalating. It is escalating. And it will continue to escalate because she ends the scene by going, Daddy, if I die first, I'll wait for you forever. And he's like, I'll wait for you too, pumpkin. And look, if that's foreshadowing to this little girl dying, it's gross, but I get it. It is not. It's nope. just a crazy thing his daughter said, and he was like, put it in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's the thing is that ultimately, again, this is a movie where nothing really happens. So we keep having to have these scenes. And then as movie viewers, we're you know kind of programmed to say, well, what are they setting up with the scene? What purpose is this? Scene? It's just there to fill time, <laughs> right? So as soon as you start trying to establish meaning to them, you've already lost this game. Yeah. There's a square for the Christian movie bingo card. It's just there to fill time. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. i put it right in the middle. So, okay. So we cut back to Sione with the shovels. I thought he was making his son dig his own grave. I wasn't yep. that far off. No, he's burying him like that one short story from the Crypt Keeper where they like makes the guy drown while, while showing him a video of the other lady drowning. <laughs> I, I think you're uh, getting a little too specific with the reference, but they, they, he buries him to his neck. Yeah. So he buries him in the in the fucking on the beach to his neck. I'm like, boy, I sure hope you calculated the tides correctly. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but apparently, at least from what we because then the tide does come in and he starts to drown. And I'm like, OK, so he was going to drown his son to death over this mild disagreement. Seems a bit extreme. Also seems weird that the son was like, all right, fine, I'll let you bury me up to my neck. Yeah, I feel like at some point you fight back, but, you know, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's his punishment for expressing sympathy to the Mormons and helping a Mormon escape the wrath of Catholicism is that he gets buried to his neck beside the ocean and it starts to rain. It like, starts to be a like terrible storm. Now, we have to fucking cut back to the Mormon family because I guess this guy, again, this is Coley Pokey's story. He's the one writing this shit. I guess he didn't want his character to not also have some harrowing event. So we have this completely unrelated to anything bit where a coconut gets thrown through their window. It never comes yeah. back. Yeah. And again, that only exists because he was like, yeah, that was the night that uh, he got buried up to his neck by his dad and his brother died but but our window got broken a I, we had a went broken, through the window it was very unfortunate it was glass Hard all over the floor those. we didn't oh, uh, it's a real bitch. have a vacuum there <laughs> so yeah but the mom and dad realize okay probably shouldn't have buried him up to his neck the you know with the way, way the weather is he's probably gonna drown we, we've got to go out there and get him but while they're out there while they're running to get him his brother Fatai gets hit by lightning and dies gets killed yeah gets hit by lightning and dies hey look i know there's no god but if i was in the middle of having an argument with someone about religion and on my way out someone close to me got hit by lightning i would take a good hard look at my <laughs> side of the argument right but yeah no he dies and then the dad goes wandering out to find tooltie to see if it's you know, he still has time to dig him out, but apparently he's dug himself out because you could just do that, right? Like, almost <laughs> certainly you would just be able to pull yourself out of that. So Fatai died for nothing is the key. Right, but but dad, bad dad, he kneels down like he thinks he's sunk into the beach, right? He's like, no, he has been taken away by the <laughs> right? sand <Yes>. gnomes. <laughs> Or like he's like Mormon treasure, you know, he keeps slipping further and further down. Yeah, that's yeah, that must have been it. All right. Well, I know we were all super attached to Fatai, the brother as a character. So we're going to give you a minute to gather yourself. But we'll be back in a flash with even more of the other side of heaven too. fire of faith to Fatai to furious. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Hey there, Nora, what you doing? Well, you know, ever since you brought that healthy cereal home from the last ad, I've been inspired to finally get in shape. Really? So how are you going to do that? Well, by doing a bunch of push-ups two nights in a row and then forgetting about it forever. <laughs> Would you really say a bunch? Uh, several. 
Okay, is that all? No. Uh, I'm also going to buy an insanely overpriced piece of fitness equipment I don't actually have room for in the house under the hopes that something so expensive and intrusive will force me to work out. (laughs) No, if you really want to get in shape, don't try repetitive workouts and overpriced gimmicks. Just try FitBod. What's FitBod? Look, there's no perfect body for everybody, but that doesn't stop most workout products from treating everyone the same. But FitBod creates a fitness program that continually adapts to you, so you stay challenged with new exercises, pacing, and intensity based on where you are and where you want to be. Well, wow, that does sound better than being grunted at by a personal trainer at the gym whose only qualification is his ability to eat dry protein powder without wincing. It is. I've been using FitBot app for a few weeks now, and I love the way it tailors the workouts to my schedule, my goals, and the equipment I already have on hand. And the variety keeps it fun and challenging. So is it making a difference? Sure. I already feel like I have more energy, and unlike pretty much every other workout routine I've ever tried, I'm two weeks in and I haven't gotten bored with it yet. I don't know. That sounds pretty expensive. Right. Well, personalized training can be tough on the budget, but FitBod is only $9.99 a month or $59.99 a year. And if you sign up now, you'll get 25% off your membership. Wow. Well, so how do I get started? You can pick up the pace on your fitness journey with FitBod today, and your future self will thank you. Get 25% off your membership today at FitBod.me slash GAM. That's 25% off at fitbod.me slash gam. Fitbod. They don't have a slogan, but it still seems like I should say something additional after the offer. Hi, Mr. God. Quick question about some miracle work. Sure, Gabriel. Come in. Yeah, it's um, it's about some Mormon missionaries down in Tofua. We've been trying to help the Baptist minister down there see that he's wrong. So he turned his son Mormon. Good, good. Right, but instead of, like, listening to him, he just freaked out and buried him alive. Buried? Whoa, that's not good. Um, did you punish him? Yeah, yeah, we did. I I got authorization from the office for a lightning strike. Ooh, a lightning strike. Wow, I bet that set him straight. Okay, get this. No, it didn't. Wait, so, so, so this guy was arguing with his son about me. His other son got struck by lightning, and he's still not convinced. Still not convinced. Wow. Uh, Well, you know what? We do have a white guy there who could be passingly polite to him and change his mind. Yeah, let's do that. We'll do that. Yeah, let's go with that then. We'll do. Uh, Just one question. Sure, God. What is it? You don't think there's a better system for who should go to heaven than whether or not you believe a homesick teenager who barely speaks your language, do you? I mean, pretty much any other system you can imagine would be better. Oh. Oh, well, beans. Yep. Beans indeed, sir. Beans indeed. And we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the action the morning after the storm with Tootai roaming the beach all injured and shit. He comes across Natani, the guy that he helped escape. Yeah, he apparently got seriously injured in digging himself out from, like, Five and a half feet of sand? Yeah, I don't honestly, like, never had to do that myself. I feel like as a magician, you probably know some kind of trick or something of how you hold (laughs) your arms while you're getting buried or whatever. But he's at death's door because of it. Yeah, he will spend the next, like, two and a half scenes almost being dead from got buried a little bit itis. Yeah, I I don't. I mean, I don't know. It, It seems like. You know, he probably got a cut of cold. It was very rainy that night, I would think. <laughs> anyway, so then we cut to Fatai's funeral, the one that got struck by lightning. And I wanted like somebody to be like, it's kind of funny. You buried the one kid as punishment. And now you're burying another. Now you bury the so other I, one. You just, that's too I, it's like, you'll get eventually, though, to you. It'll be like, it's ironic. It's at least <laughs> ironic. He's also doing like he's doing this very weird, passive aggressive eulogy for his son at God. He's like, do not be scared. Or sad of lightning. Just stupid. Sorry, my wife is crying really <laughs> loud. It's throwing me off. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, no, he has a very stay the course eulogy, right? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm writing in my nose like, dude, if your plan that ends with one of my sons died, but the other dug his way out doesn't get you rethinking your decision tree process, nothing's going to do it. All right. <laughs> I mean, look. In his defense, if I'm a god guy and there's just been a lightning strike that did not go my way, I'm I'm gonna have to tell some people to stay the course. <laughs> okay, all right. No, no trust fair. me, guys. 
Trust me, I know that like literally the cartoon version of God being mad at me happened, but I, <laughs> that one sometimes it's a coincidence. So okay, so that night Tuatai wakes up. He's all injured and raspy from the digging his way out itis, and he tells Natani that he wants to be baptized as a Mormon in case he doesn't make it through the night. Again, I am very unclear about what is wrong with this young man. Right. Well, so, okay, this whole scene was confusing to me until I remembered that every Mormon movie has to have a please would someone baptize me as a Mormon fantasy moment yeah, there. No, it's true. It's the, it's the I'll give you a blowjob for fixing my car tire or delivering yeah. my pizza of Mormon <laughs> exactly. cinema. <Yeah. laughs> They're out there. They're out there just begging. You got to jack off to something, man. You got to jack off to something. Yeah, they won't, they're not allowed to have porn. Can't even do it through the underwear. So, yeah, so he drags this guy who's, you know, like from the way he's playing it, he's got like a pneumonia and he's got a broken something, a broken ribs or something like that. That's how they're playing it. So he brings that guy out into the ocean to dip him in water so he can say his magic spell. Okay. Question question mm -hmm. he says it will hurt when i put you under the water yeah what could possibly be wrong with this young man <laughs> that it will hurt got a paper cut Ooh, ouchy salt <laughs> this salt water hello <laughs> so, no, I, I have a collarbone <laughs> burn i think it's because he was bending him over right? like he's got broken ribs or whatever so by bending you over i'm gonna hurt you it was my guess fucking dunk dude i feel like there should have been more to, like hey, do you want to just do a dunk because like, 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 it feels like you would ease him into like he got into yeah. that bed somehow yeah take some time figure it out it, because he's like oh let me baptize you and you're like oh i don't want to hurt you and now he's like all right power bomb <laughs> <laughs> all right you asked for it but the key is though that Toatai is now a mormon and he can just feel the Mormonism flowing through his veins. Damn right. So, okay. So we cut over to Coley Pokey's wife. Jean is this character's name. She gets a name like nine tenths of the way through the fucking movie. But Jean is domesticated ing. <laughs> when John runs out, he's super excited. He's He's gotten approval from the head Mormon, I guess, to build a new chapel in Neotopotapu, which is the island that the first movie took place on. And here's what's fucking incredible about the next, I'm going to say genuinely like 20 minutes of the movie. Nothing happened when he took his family to Neo Tawa right? Yeah, right, right. Nothing fucking happened. Nope. So we're now going to spend 20 minutes being like, and then I introduced her to the last movie. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so something happens on the way. We'll we'll get to it, but yes. Yeah. But it, it requires this movie to just take a weird-ass 25-minute diversion that in no way advances the plot. It is Fast and the Furious levels of expectation of previous <laughs> well, knowledge. Too, yeah. So, okay, so they have to go to Neotoputapu, and they have to get there. They have to take this boat. Now, I love the way this scene starts off because they've got five kids at this point. She's had the one that she was pregnant with when they got to the island. I can't remember if she's pregnant again or not at this point in the movie, to be honest with you, but she will yeah, be. She will reveal she's pregnant on this. Oh, boat you're right. Ride. You're right. That's right. And because, you know, let's face it, it's pretty hard to keep five children on set all at the same time. They have to get rid of a couple of these kids for the boat ride scene. So they're like, oh, it's so weird to have left our two children with invisible black helper lady for several days, <laughs> but I guess they'll be fine, huh? All right. I mean, if you say we can only put 50% of our children on one boat at any time, maybe it's like an <laughs> eggs in the basket thing, right? They'll put <laughs> right, eggs bring in one, one kid back and yeah. then the other kid. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> He'll eat the bag of rice is what the problem is. The kid will. But yeah, but and also, by the way, this is a five day one way boat ride. So they're leaving for fucking weeks for this trip mm -hmm. and also they're on a tiny ass little boat with like six other guys yeah all of whom are bringing life-saving infrastructure supplies to this island it is like someone is taking a disney cruise on a life raft <laughs> they're just like <laughs> taking selfies water yeah love it this is also where we get the fucking moment with nuku yes uh-huh 
again, just the solid brass balls on this movie to be like, huh? You remember that kid who fell out of the mango tree and then John used his magic oil on him and he got better? Well, he's back in this movie. Who in the theater was like, fuck, I told you Nuku would be back. Love this. Love this. <laughs> yes. I hope Charlize Theron shows up and attacks them with magnets. <laughs> And I've got to say, by bringing him back in, they also have to like relive how stupid the first movie is because he's got to like now like introduce this kid to his family on the boat and go like, this is the kid I brought back from the dead. (laughs) And everybody's like, right, right. When you brought someone back from the dead, right. That's a normal thing for you. I have just said to all of us for sure. I guess as long as we don't spend the rest of the movie caring about whether or not someone dies, that won't have any stakes. So yeah, yeah, as long as as that's not the issue. (laughs) Okay, and then we get just a nice, a lovely little musical interlude. <laughs> the movie's just like, uh, and then, uh, I don't know, Sione, he's super sad still. His kid's dead. Um, Everyone's, uh, you know, just uh, upset on. or happy about wherever they are <laughs> in the movie. This is movie for, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> This is movie for, okay, we promised the Tongans they could make a CD at the same time while were, we shot yeah. our movie. Yeah. All right. So now this is key. And I apologize for all the fucking explanation I have to give you logistically here. But this boat that they're on is towing a barge. And for some reason, someone has to be on the barge at all times. So they keep like reeling in this barge and swapping out who has to be out there. This time, it's Nuku, the kid who came back from the dead in the first one's turn to go to the barge. Mm -hmm. And... Fucking Coley Pokey's nine-year-old daughter has taken a liking to this guy, so she wants to spend some alone time on this barge they're towing with him. Yeah, I mean, she is a Mormon, so she's practically an old maid at this well, point. Well, right. Well, exactly. Yeah. And and then I was going to say, in a long-practiced Mormon move, <laughs> Coley Pokey gives his underage daughter to some strange man simply because he's also a Mormon. And what's amazing is you can see them trying to construct a movie out of a nothing scene, right? Because right. what happened is, oh, when we were on the boat on my way to the thing where I saw someone and nothing happened, there was a storm and it was really bad. Let me tell you, we almost died. And they were like, cool, that was a sentence and a half. Yep. How do we make that 28 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, and of course, the thing about it is that every bit of tension that this movie will ever manage to find is only there because this guy is just crazy nonchalant about his family's safety. Const- until they are inches from death. Yep. He's like, la, 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 la. <laughs> the Grim Reaper is bending over his children. And then he's like, wait, I never said you could come in here. Yeah, right. Exactly. So he just leaves his daughter with this not this fucking 18 year old kid that he doesn't really know. You know, he brought him back from the dead and hasn't seen him for 10 fucking years. And then a big storm rolls up. And this is where we get my best worst. We get to see the little tiny boat. <laughs> oh, my God. They're trying so hard for drama here. And it is though they gave us the little tiny boat scenes to insert in case there were ever going to be stakes. Right? He's like, no, honey, come back. Toodaloot, toodaloot. Rub-a-dub-dub, three men in a tub. My daughter, I'll never just be in the we, The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. It's so funny. And this all culminates in the least necessary and dumbest thing ever. So the, the storm is pulling on the barge and the big you know that thing that always comes loose in movies right everyone's Mm -hmm. always got a spool of very heavy rope but that doesn't have a break or that break breaks very easily so it stretches out to its thing and for no fucking reason no reason you could possibly conceive of guy runs over to coley pokey and is like you must cut the rope and drown your child yes look i'm not saying there's no reason why that rope would need to be cut there's definitely no reason why Coley Pokey needed to do it. Right. You were holding the axe, man. <laughs> so, yeah, he hands him the axe and he's like, you must sacrifice your daughter's life. And I'm like, well, he's obviously not going to do that because they wouldn't admit that in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> And sure enough, he goes, he raises the axe like he's really thinking about it and then throws the axe away. Yeah. He does the fucking point break shoot into the air thing. Yeah. With the axe. <laughs> but there's this fantastic moment. He throws it. He's like, no. And you see everyone else be like, 
Well, that's just a waste of an axe. Well, now we, we got to buy a new one. We don't have we're a on ton a of axes. Island, you can't just go to the Walmart here, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are other reasons we may no- need an axe. Yet it's a five day trip back too, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so he throws away the axe and he prays to Mormon God and damn it if the storm doesn't just immediately stop. Yeah. And then it, the, his daughter pops up on the barge and so does Nuku and it turns out everybody's just fine and literally nothing happened. <laughs> daughter pops up. Is that the closest we have to stakes in the movie? Yeah, yes, that's the closest honey, it it'll okay. ever be to stakes in the movie. Yeah. So, okay. Now, as if he hasn't been careless enough, we get this bizarre ass fucking scene. They get to their destination, the island of I didn't, I scrolled beyond where I had it written. <laughs> so, <laughs> that island they were going to. They get there and the dock has been destroyed in the storm. Okay. So they can't just pull up to the dock like they normally would. Instead, they're going to have to, I am not making this shit up, throw their children. Up against the sheer wall. Against a sheer cliff wall to the people that wait for them above. So no beaches on this island, huh? Not no a single beaches anywhere. Goddamn one anywhere. <laughs> yeah. This is the only it's it's just it's cliff face all the way around. It's a very unusual island in that way. It's like walking up to the top of the Empire State Building and being like Oh, the elevator's full. All right, kids, jump out. Jump. <laughs> yeah. Come on. We, gotta... <laughs> we have to get down. We have dinner reservations. No other so. possibility. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, it's it, like, and and look, there is a point where they throw a baby, I'm going to say 10 yards. Yeah. Now, it's a doll, right? But when they throw it's it, very because much doll, yeah. the thing that he's saying he did in real life would be illegal to do in real life. Yeah. No, you can't do that in real life. <laughs> but yeah, that's how they get on the island. Chuck the fucking baby like they're at the Pike Place fish market or something. <laughs> and then we have this weird ass scene where he just goes down a line and all of the characters from the last movie are like, hi, I was in the last movie. And that's it. <laughs> and also they're all the same actors, which is a weird reuniting thing. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, I mean, look, it's nothing's as terrifying as the Friends reunion on HBO Max. <laughs> but this is the Mormon version of that. And they are really counting on you having some like strong memories from that. They, 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 this movie only works if the first one really made an impression, right? Because like at one point, one lady uh, sees him and she checks his feet and she's like, oh, they look great. And they don't explain it at all. <laughs> yep. His feet were eaten by rats mm-hmm. one time. So, okay. So that night they have a big cookout in Coley Pokey's honor. Yep. Mom looks thrilled to, uh, to be eating something with a head still on it. It's so Again, there, nothing happened on this visit. He went there. They were like, hey, we remember you. He was like, all right, everybody, bye. So they're just, they're stalling for time. Like, he, we might as well watch him take a shit and just, like, check his watch, <laughs> read a book. Yeah. Right. It's a, this is a goddamn white savior montage, ultimately, right? They honored him who brought Mormonism to their island all those years ago with the, with the big feast. And he tells them all a bunch of Mormon stories and everybody just is so wrapped that they fall asleep right where they are sitting while he's telling the stories. That's not that's not a good sign <laughs> that you're telling great stories, man. And uh, girl, he should have fucked in first movie is here to be like, I thought she said she was Anne Hathaway. Shut up. She's not. In- <laughs> <laughs> she was Anne Hathaway in college. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they were all Anne Hathaway in ch- college. No illusions. <laughs> they were all Anne Hathaway in college. <laughs> Darling, you can't get mad at me. Carl the Pug of Pegacorn made that joke. Yeah, right. No, exactly. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so they all fall asleep right there where they were partying. This includes his wife and their little fucking baby. She just fell asleep on the fucking under the stars on this island with her baby. Yeah, no, this is the fucking the ch- child neglect is the plot. <laughs> Just Tonk and Eli slowly crawls over to the baby, puts the little humidifier temperature water <laughs> next to it, has its face down in the mud. There you go. So, yeah, but that was it. That that was the, the whole point of this trip. We will never refer back to it or anything like that. So now we're on the return voyage. And of course, mom vomits. And we all know there's only one reason women in movies vomit. And that's pregnancy. Pregnancy. With their sixth child. Sixth child. They're really spreading out the stakes on the skid. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, when are these people finding time to 
fuck? <laughs> They're sleeping on a goddamn tugboat with eight other people. What? How the hell is this even happening? Why do you think they sent the daughter across to go hang out with me? Yeah, Nuku? right, right. Apparently, get a quickie in. So, all right. So, but then we we have to establish though that Jean is totally digging this. Like, even if she had autonomy, she'd probably still be doing exactly this. So we see her at the Mormon church giving her little. I'm a happy Mormon wife sermon. <laughs> they have a blackboard behind her. I'm sure she said words and I was supposed to pay attention to them. They have a blackboard and on it is just the word faith circled twice. <laughs> like faith. And then you're also going to need faith. You're going to also need way more faith. Trust me. Right. As soon as you start reading the book, you know, you're going to be like, he couldn't make a sword just from looking at one. It makes <laughs> no sense. So, yeah, so it's so he gives and then after she's done, she sits down, he tags in and he's giving all of his new missionaries their missionary assignments. Oh, I wanted so badly for him to be like, all right, Untaku and Moa Woa, you are going to Boise, Idaho. Yeah. So um, <laughs> turns out we do swapsies now. Yeah, right, right. So and and then, of course, the last people that he assigns to their mission is to that again that island that i don't remember the pronunciation of the one he was just at though and he tells him he's like and by the way like i you know tell him i say i'm i'm kind of the caucasian god of that island so uh <laughs> like, drop my name if you need anything yeah if you want to tip less than 20 percent at a restaurant tell him i sent you <laughs> <laughs> all right so now we have to go back to the closest thing this movie has to an interesting plot line we cut back over to sioni that's the evil reverend that wanted his son to drown the pig. He has tracked down Natani, the new Mormon, and he demands to know where his son is. This scene is so fucking funny. I know sometimes we're like, watch the movies, don't watch the movies. You don't need to watch this whole movie, but you definitely need to watch this scene because no, tell me if I'm wrong here. The guy who plays bad dad, preacher dad, pretty decent actor. Yeah, he's good. He has been given my son is dead to me 44 times yes. in this script. Yes. But he's also asking information. So he'd be like, have you seen my son? Yeah, he's actually because he's dead to me. Yeah, oh, right. Um, <laughs> okay, well, he's been assigned to the he's dead to me. I don't care. Know. I don't he's care dead. because he's dead. It doesn't matter where he is. It's like a grave. He does. He pulls an Eli Bosnick at one point and overextends his metaphor. He's like, so he is a missionary now. Tell me, where did they bury my son? And the guy's very clearly like, bury your son? He's like, I, where is he? Because he's dead to me. He's dead to me. He's dead to me. Like a grave is what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you just see this actor's eyes widening each time he's asked to say he's dead to me again. Well, and I look, because he's like, I don't know where your son is. Only the the head Mormon, Coley Pokey, would know. You'll have to go ask him. And he's like, oh, I don't want to go ask some white guy where my fucking son is. And he's like, hey, Coley Pokey is a good man. And I just, I have to point that line out because this is his fucking story, right? <laughs> he's writing a story where he's putting words in the mouths of it. This isn't a conversation he would have overheard or anything. Nope. He's just nope. writing a story. And he's like, they were probably talking about what a swell guy I am, actually. At the How time. awesome <laughs> so, I am. <man. laughs> but I, to, to be fair, though, then he undercuts the fuck out of it. He's like, he's a good man, just like you, Sioni. I'm like, that dude buried his son to the to his neck and left him to die out on the beach. Like, what are you, <laughs> what are you trying to say, bro? <laughs> yep. So, but this is time for the big confrontation. Sione goes to see Coley Pokey. And, you know, he tries to be nice, but Sione won't let him. <laughs> and again, he's like, he is dead to me. And he's like, okay, sorry to hear that. And he's like, where is he? Also, he's dead to me, but I, I want to know where yeah, he he's is. Like, well, he goes, he goes, you know, where is he? He's like, well, I sent your son to, he goes, he's not my son anymore. He's like, right, dead to you. I, I sent the dead body of, of the fucking artist I formerly don't. known as your <laughs> no, son. Your son. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, do you want to see him? And he's like, no, I came here to yell at you and to tell you to tell my son <laughs> Don't come back. He's dead to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I love to because like he's like, you know, he's like, well, I was I'm a Catholic reverend and you're a Mormon. And I'm like, oh, God, but but no, it's just, <laughs> he just he Columbo's him and everything. Imagine how much you have to suck as a dad for the Mormons to treat your kid better. That's all I'm saying. Okay? <laughs> so, 
All right. Well, I tell you what. I think we've just established ourselves a conflict just as Ooh. Act 2 is winding to a close. So let me give Act 3 the closest thing I can to a hard sell. Will Coley Pokey use his children to bait an alligator trap? How much more pointless danger do I have to watch him put them in? Is it too late to prosecute John Grobert for child neglect? Find out the answers to less interesting questions and more when we return for the and then we went home conclusion of The Other Side of Heaven 2, Fire of Faith. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hey, podcast listeners, listen to here, chiming in to remind you that if there's something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, there may be help out there. There's no shame in getting therapy, and our sponsor, BetterHelp, will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online. You can log in to your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely, thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. Look, as a person living in a small and very religious town, I get how hard it might be to find help locally. But BetterHelp is available for clients worldwide with therapists that are secular, trans-affirming, and sex and sex work positive. Plus, BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, financial aid is available, and GAM listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. So there's no reason not to try it. Visit their website to learn more. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash awful, where you can join the over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Remember, for 10% off your first month, visit BetterHelp dot com slash awful and start living a happier life today. B-U-S-Y-B-O-N-K-E-Y, busy donkey. What's the donkey busy doing? Being busy? Hello and kala atua. God damn it, it's a white guy. Hi. Hi, that was almost my language. Can I help you? I bring good news. Cool. Is it food or medicine or material for safer infrastructure on one of the most remote islands in the world? Nope. Even better. It's good news about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm already Christian. Thank you. Please, please don't kill me. I am. I know, I know. But this is like a new and improved testament of Jesus Christ. Seriously? Your religion has updates like Windows? Kind of weird that you have a a Windows reference handy here. But uh, yes, yes, this book tells the story of Jesus Christ arriving in America. I cannot overemphasize how little that means to me. So long ago, there was this man named Moroni. Sorry, sorry. I just want to stop you right there. Is there any way that listening to this new, and I'm just going to go ahead and guess it, somehow more boring version of the Bible leads to me getting medicine or shelter? Well, you know, I guess if enough Mormons came here as missionaries, they'd have to build a proper hospital and airport and stuff for them. So Moroni, you say? Right. So he's building this ship, uh, right? Tight as a dish. As a dish. Yes. Great measurement of tightness. (laughs) (laughs) And we're back for more of this shit. And we're going to pick up the story on Sioni delivering an amazing Mormons can go fuck themselves sermon. Hello, everybody. Uh, My son is dead to me. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. He has this whole speech where he goes like, Now, a lot of you have heard me say Mormons can go fuck themselves a number of times. And you're probably wondering, now that my son is a Mormon, do I still think that Mormons can go fuck themselves? Well, my son is dead to me, so they can (laughs) obviously still go fuck themselves. Anyway, that was the entire sermon, let us pray. (laughs) And he goes, they must be dead to you like my son is dead to me. And I really wanted him to be like, to clarify, I mean the one who isn't actually dead. I know right, you were all like here. I, my, 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 I do have a dead son, <laughs> which should be very uh, confusing. Okay, and then we cut over to Coley Pokey's baby factory. I, I mean, wife. And it looks like the baby's coming. So they go to this terrible 1965 Tongan hospital. Oh. 
and we get this whole like, oh, she has to run to go get the doctor. Nobody has a vehicle that can take her. Yeah, this movie can't get over how adorable this impoverished nation they've done nothing to help is. Right. That's what's so fucking terrifying is that like we see this terrible hospital and there and we're like, oh, you guys are building a fucking church somewhere, aren't you? Wow. A church. Is- <laughs> oh, you actually brought a barge full of resources to a separate island so you could build a chapel, didn't you? We watched that 20 minutes ago in this movie. <gasps> Fuck you guys. Wow. Also, there's just this fantastic thing of like the Tongans. She starts to give birth and the Tongans all show up and start to sing. And I was just like. Yeah, women love involuntary music when they're going through labor. And also, like, lots of strangers. They love that, too. Yeah, no, they got a whole fucking band comes in. They've got, like, instruments. They got guitars and shit. Everybody comes to sing songs to her wide-open vagina. And they're very excited <laughs> about all this. That band, by the way, shows up faster than the doctor. Yep. They do beat the doctor. So, yeah. And then... I don't know. Maybe this is true. By your seventh baby, maybe you do just sort of grunt twice and pop it out or whatever. But she. um, Yeah, she's just got to slip and slide in there at this point. You know, I guess. Yeah, because when the doctor gets there, he's like, OK, put up oh, done. All right, baby yep. crying, whining. But it's a boy. He's had five daughters and now he finally has a son because that's what really matters in life. And this actor, so they got a pretty fresh baby for this movie. Mm -hmm. This actor holds this baby like he's demoing rifles at a gun show. Yes. The little little baby's like, hey, little neck support, please. Little neck support. (laughs) Little neck support, please. (laughs) He's absolutely holding this thing like like a fucking prize he won for daytime dramas or something. Yeah. (laughs) And then so, yeah, he holds up the baby for everybody to see. They all sing to it some more. And then. We get home and have a quick, you know, another quick white savior montage. Yeah. And this montage includes the time that they all dressed like characters from Clue to go see the Queen of Tonga. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, they go. They went and saw the Queen of Tonga, who had kind of sort of half established as a character. He is dressed as Mr. Peanut. Yeah. Right. So there's just suddenly a scene where Coley Pokey is dressed as Mr. Peanut. And then we're supposed to carry on with our lives. (laughs) And. Also, like, this montage is ignoring something that they entirely ignored in the first movie, which is, like, when he got to Tonga, the Tongan royalty were like, we don't give a shit about that kid. Let him die. So this is them being like, (laughs) she actually did eventually meet us. Just so you know, she did let us come over. I dress like Mr. Peanut. So (laughs) if you think about it, I'm I'm pretty much her best friend. Yes. Yeah, so the, that just fucking devolves into a general Mormoning montage. And, uh, and of course, Sione is still super sad about the both figurative and literal sun dying stuff. Yeah. All right. So this montage resolves with Coley Pokey preaching and <laughs> he's got this weird like salvation flow <laughs> chart behind him. It's so complex and stupid. <laughs> it's great. Okay. So how about this? There is a circle on there somewhere that says spirit world over the top of it. It's divided with a squiggly line into paradise and spirit prison. And that is not the weirdest thing. On not the, the weirdest thing. And it's so <laughs> funny and convoluted. And of course, the first spoken line in this scene is it's true. Yes, it's all true. <laughs> right. He might as well be explaining the rules to cones of Dunshire. And then he's like, it's, it's all <laughs> it's true. Death is on his thing at the beginning. This is what it starts with death. And it's it's got like a jagged enclosure, like a bam or a whiff might or something. <laughs> it's like, and and oh, and then Thomas Monson shows back up. I just had him down as bug squisher guy in my notes because I didn't know who the fuck he was until the end of the movie. And he like, I guess, tags in on the sermon here. Yeah, he shows up for a second. Just be like, hello, just a reminder, I was here during this movie. A very, very important, important person that I am. But just then, one of his daughters shows up to tell Coley Pokey that his son is sick and he must rush home quickly. Oh, no. And just a quick note. They rush home. We're going to get to that because that's the rest of the movie. As they're rushing home, someone dives out of the way with a Wilhelm scream. A Wilhelm fucking scream. Yes. Yes. Weird. Weird choice. I loved that weird comedic moment that someone snuck in despite the objections of the Mormons. (laughs) 
But yeah, so his son is very sick. There's something wrong with his heart. And it, this is the plot of the movie, apparently. It always was. Podcast listener, the rest of the plot of this movie will be, oh no, we have to receive the same medical care as the people we have been talking to about their religion for the last 30 years. That is until we fly away and get our white people medical care again. Right. It's not even we need to cure our child in Tonga. It's we just need to get our child healthy enough in Tonga so we can fly him back and give him the real medicine. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And keep in mind that like the whole first act of this movie was filled with people being like, you know, if anybody gets sick in your family, it's almost a death sentence to be way the hell out here or away from good medicine and everything. So like again, his neglect is the conflict. Yep. Yeah. And let's not forget that when they told him that he was like, don't worry, it's all going to be fine. I've got plenty of children to spare. <laughs> I'll leave with more than I came with, believe it or not. Yeah. And one other thing I have to touch on about this movie that we haven't touched on is they make a big deal of the fact that this latest baby is the son. Mm -hmm. Right. He's had five daughters and the sixth one is the son. And you can't help but feel there's a little bit of like a. Well, no, you can't kill the boy one. I mean, I've got, yes. I would say I've got three spare girls, right? You could kill three of the girls and I'm still good, but don't kill the boy. The boy matters. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, but we've established that as the big conflict. Then we have the scene where he has to see Thomas Monson off, right? And, and, and this again, pure hagiography, right? There's no reason for this scene, but it's just like, uh, it's just the main character sitting there going like, I know you very well. You've slept in my home. He's like, I have slept in your home and I am a good and noble person that cares deeply about you. And that's it. I know that just for necessity of the plot, we have me flying away right now and leaving you here to do your job while your son is dying. But Say I'm a great guy. You're a great I did, guy. I All right. did it as a great and a great guy kind of way. Yeah. So, okay. So he leaves. We get the scene where Coley Pokey's driving down the road and like somebody comes on the radio to ask people to pray for his kid. Yeah. It gets aggressive. They're like, and we'll be doing a fast for Coley Pokey. And then there's like two more beats. And he's like, anyone who is found not fasting will be forced to fast. Yes. Like, oh, <laughs> Let's feel a little cargo culty. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So then we cut to Sione and his wife and she's like, Hey, you know, did you hear on the radio that the, uh, that the white savior is, uh, is, he's got a sick kid. So like, I don't give a fuck. My kid's dead to me. And she's like, I know your kid is dead to you. God, we don't feel bad for other people's babies, just our babies, <laughs> except for the ones that I killed with my mind. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Yeah, and she says, you know, she says, I know you hate that guy and Mormonism and everything, but nobody will ever go along with you in your hate because you made your flock too Christian with all your great Catholic reverending. They, I believe they can't even hate Whitey if they try to. <laughs> yep. And also, like, we keep having this, like, when people keep telling this guy, but you're a good man, though, and it's just, he's very clearly not. I mean, if you I wanted him that. to be a good man, you could have written him as one. That's what those establishing shots at the beginning are for. Right. When you open up on him burying his kid alive, it's going to be real hard to redeem him. You're going to have to work yep. a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then we have to see fucking Thomas Monson do some magic, right? Oh, this, is the <laughs> this is the best insert of Thomas Monson. Yes. Which is that Thomas fucking Monson, right, fucking called... Right. And was like, hey, I just want you to know I spoke to God because I'm the president of Mormon and your day, your kid's going to be fine. And they shoot it as a scene like God fucking zapped him from behind with a taser with that information. Yes. Yeah. He's just sitting there getting a, a haircut. He's in New Zealand. He's flown off to New Zealand. So he's getting a haircut. And I'm sorry, like we don't see his left hand. So I'm assuming he's stroking his cock with it. Yeah. It's right. definitely the space work he's doing. He's he's really enjoying that hair. I guess, you know, like, look, you deny somebody porn long enough, they're going to have to take it where they can find it. And then he just sits up like he suddenly was like, like he had a sudden emergency memory. But no, that was God telling him, don't worry, the baby will be fine. So he calls. He, he calls him. And he says, hey, man, your baby's going to be fine. God just uh, hooked me up with that knowledge. Yeah. So we cut back to him, like, telling his wife, hey, don't worry, bug squisher guy called and um, 
kid's going to be fine. We, he's got an authority from God, and he speaks for God. So. Yeah. And they've got this great, almost self-aware conversation where she's like, hey, we've dedicated our whole life to God. We came to this island in the middle of nowhere. It sure looks like God's about to murder our son. And he's like, Elder Monson interrupted his haircut. It's all right. Yeah, exactly. For us. So, and I, you know what, honestly, like the actors in this movie generally are pretty good. You know, there's no Anne Hathaway in it, but like they're pretty good. And I was feeling so sorry for them with this clunky, stupid dialogue where he has to just repeat what she just said of the question mark on it over and over again. Bless their little hearts. But he trades off with her. He's like, you know, you go to bed and I'll be worried about the baby in your stead for a little while. Yep. And then so the camera starts to back away from him. He's got his back to us. And the soundtrack starts having this like elderly Tongan man sing with this very <laughs> deep, very distinctive voice. And it seems like it's coming out of Coley Pokey at first. Yeah, it's the uh, Spaceballs old man. River yes, moment. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, but this is diegetic. Apparently, people have just shown up at his house now like it's a uh, fucking sick baby carolers or something. That's a Tongan tradition. Yeah. And I hate to have a moment where I check my own privilege in the middle of our comedy podcast review, but there's this this scene while this is happening, they're singing and the baby is struggling for air. And it's this very intense, dramatic moment. And I turn to look at my son while this is happening because I'm thinking, oh, my baby, I'm so glad. And he's literally buried under the pile of toys his grandmother has got him. <laughs> and I was like, there you have it, folks. The two extremes. Yeah. Smothering <laughs> on the floor of a Tongan hospital and my kid can't get out from underneath the fucking third ride along horse his grandma got him. <laughs> and look, and, and this is the fucked up thing about it because again, this is just you know, I'm sorry for them that their kid was sick or, you know, it must have been it must have been very rough for them being in this island and having to wait for him to get better enough to fly. But but like that's just the kind of banal shit that happens to people. It doesn't have movie level stakes. Right. So they are trying their damnedest to wring some dramatic tension from this. Right. And the implication, by the way, of the stakes of this movie as they are right now is. Man, it's a good thing this isn't a Tongan kid because that kid would just be fucking dead, wouldn't it? Right, right, exactly, right. The stakes of this movie could best be described as, but it's a white kid. Yeah, being white. The yeah. stakes in this movie are being <laughs> right. white. Right. I love he goes out to thank the carolers and they have a little conversation to give him some banana bread to eat and it's magical banana bread, so it'll be extra good for him. Yeah. And then they say, oh, we we have one more request we'd like to do an encore. And he's like, oh, I thought it would be me that would ask for that. But uh, it's <laughs> traditional. But OK, yeah. Really wanted him to say no. <laughs> my, me, uh, and my, me and the kid are trying to sleep. So maybe another rehearsal or two <laughs> for you. OK, so and then we get we cut to Tuotai. Now, Tuotai has been sent off to do his Mormon missionary work with, you know, his companion or whatever. But his uncle has tracked him down and is going to drag him out of his hut and beat the fuck out of him for changing religions. Yeah, but it's apparently a very severe ass kicking because it will be the secondary stakes for the rest of the movie. Yeah, well, you know, Tuatai totally could have won that fight if he wanted to. He didn't want to. He was yeah. too Christian. He didn't, fight, he didn't fight back because of the Christianity. What happened to God helps those who do some fucking risk control? Come right. on, guys. <laughs> Yeah, but he gets his ass kicked. And so his like his mission companion, God, they had, every every title in Mormonism is creepy. His mission companion drags his near lifeless body to Nuku's boat and, and sends him to he's like, hey, can you take him to the hospital? He's like, yeah, that's a five day trip. We established that earlier in the movie, but um, I'm sure, sure. I'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. I was so sad that they didn't throw him down. Right. They had established that throwing was the way you get up to it from the boat. <laughs> And honestly, if they just like kicked this guy off the ledge and we watched him like slap down oh, onto the deck. Oh, shit. You got it. Oh. On one. On uh, one is when we normally do it. So. Babies are a lot less heavy. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, he gets to he gets to the island miraculously or they just cut over five days and his dad is like there and he's like, 
dad, bad dad, who's been like, my son is dead, my son is dead, is like, my boy, however could this have happened? <laughs> it's like, I didn't want him to be dead to everybody else. Damn. <laughs> yeah, so, but, and of course, Coley Pokey's waiting there when they when they show up with the beat up kid. So he offers to let Sione, the Totai's dad, ride with him to the hospital. But, you know, Sione hates the Mormons, but I guess in this instance, he'll, he'll let it go. Yeah. And he's like, oh, my dear son, my former son. Let's not get bogged down in the details in such an emotional moment. Oh. <laughs> so, so they take him to the best, worst doctor. And he's like, mm, he's got the fuck beat out of him is my prognosis. <laughs> have you guys tried your healing magic? You guys have healing magic, right? He goes right to the healing magic. He's like, yeah, his brain is swelling up. That's never a good sign. So what we're going to do is we're going to wait for the swelling to go down. <laughs> do you have a timeline on that? Gotta, yep. It could be days <laughs> or months. Or, or never. Never. It could never go down at all. So the answer is no, by the way. If someone's like, hey, do you have a timeline for this? And your answer is yes or no. The answer is no. You do not right. have yeah, a timeline. If it's, if, the day, if it's one to infinity days, that doesn't count. <laughs> That's not useful. And he's like, is there anything that we can do? And he's like, uh, do you guys have any cantrips? <laughs> spell slots? Any open spell slots? And you he's like, I do. I've got, I have actually, I have some oil that I can go ahead and use. I'm going to use my magic Mormon healing oil. And again, there's just this fucking amazing moment where the movie is trying so hard not to look at us and be like, don't ask why we didn't use our magic healing powers on the baby. Don't ask why we didn't use our magic <laughs> healing powers on the baby. <laughs> well, and also like the way that this is apparently applied is to place it on somebody's forehead and then just like push down on it. <laughs> the guy's brain is swell. I feel like maybe you can put it on his arm in this instance <laughs> or something. You could just give it to him rectally or something. Give him the. Yep. I don't. I, yeah. Anyway. So, yeah, but Coley Pokey does his magic and Sione's like, wow, he did some pretty good magic for my kid. That was they, like there was oil and everything. He used a full fucking spell slot. It wasn't even a candle. Yeah. And I would like to throw this out there. He says, oh, I got to go hang with my baby. And I wrote as a joke in my notes for our comedy show. <laughs> I didn't fuck him up. So my son's in first place for magic healing. Your son is in second. That is the next scene. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yes. So he goes in to see his baby. We have a quick exchange between him and the and the mom saying like, hey, remember earlier when we said that stories always have happy endings, just in case grandma's worried that we're going to kill the baby off in this. Uh, hey. we were, that was foreshadowing. We also have one of the fucking darkest lines in cinematic history. Mom goes home for a rest towards the end of the scene. And she's like, hey, um, if the baby dies while I'm gone. Don't worry about it. Yeah. So, no, she specifically <laughs> says, if the baby dies while I'm away, don't blame yourself. And I so wanted him to go like, well, I thought I wasn't gonna. Why? why? Wow. Were you going to blame me? I, say, <laughs> why do you, is, I wanted her to correct him and be like, I mean, just, you know, because you flew us out here in the middle of nowhere. Where, there's no <laughs> where there was and, medical and the, like, time, care. And the elder Monson and that elderly couple that disappeared earlier. They both right. said that we shouldn't be here. And it was couldn't just come on my stomach. So, yeah. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that's the thing, though. It's like. It totally, it would be his fault, though, right? Like she, regardless of what she said, it would totally be his. Definitely his fault. Yeah. So, but she leaves for a while. He's gonna watch the baby. Sione watches from across the hall, like as Coley Pokey ugly cries over his baby for a bit. It was at this point in the movie that my son escaped under his pile of toys and books his grandma brought him. So again, the moment was kind of ruined for me because my son heaved himself out from <laughs> under a fucking hobby horse and was like, ah, I want some more peanut butter crackers. And I was like, all right, get you. Just get some more peanut butter crackers. Absolutely. Contrast. So, okay. So, but late that night, Coley Pokey's asleep in the rocker with a baby in his arms, which seems crazy unsafe. You could, we would just drop the fucking So kid. many things. So Terrible. Idea. I mean, they, he threw this kid around. It with, they, yeah. So I don't even remember which kid it was that he was, that he was throwing around. But he threw. He's thrown a lot of kids around. He's, so. he's a baby throwing guy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. This is not a guy who's going to be convinced by back to sleep. <laughs> so, yeah, but so Sione comes in while he's sleeping and he takes the baby out of his arms. Now 
up until now, most of what Sione's done is like, you know, try to drown pigs and bury his children up to their necks and stuff. So we're a little nervous. My first thought was, oh, he's going to turn his kid Catholic, right? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That would be pretty funny. But no, he's going to use reciprocal Catholic magic to help Coley Pokey's baby since Coley Pokey used his Mormon magic to help his son. And... He is going to place his own son in second place. Yes. Yes. He's like, God, so first take care of the white kid. Okay. Yeah. But then my kid, my kid's That's, second like, place. Like, I, 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 like there's no, it, it's like there's some so there's other people at the hospital. They're all thirds and fourths and fifths and shit. But, you know, <laughs> I just want to make sure we're prioritizing correctly. And then third place is whether or not to kick this guy's ass, which I thought was a weird add on. Okay. So it, the thing is, is that this kind of scene more or less works if Sioni is praying in a whisper. Mm -hmm. He's not. No. He's like, he's that guy being a little too loud at the hotel, right? Yep. That's the tone of voice he's praying at. And he's like, dear God, heal this kid first, my kid second. And also, should I kick this guy's ass or what? And then, of course, by now, Coley Pokey is awake. And he's like, wait, why is there a bit about kicking my ass in there? <laughs> You can't help but feel watching this and knowing that John, whatever his name is, wrote this movie that like he just fell for a guy very obviously being like, oh, dear Jesus, I'm going to pray in English for no reason. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Definitely heal this kid. I'm a good guy. I just need nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents. <laughs> and then when he realizes he's awake, he says, I'm sorry, I borrowed your baby and gives it back. And I just wrote in my notes. The Eli Bosnick story. <laughs> I, I wrote almost certainly the least harmful thing that ever happened before that apology. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. So, and there's also this weird, weird moment where he's like, uh, you know, I felt some like Caucasian power emanating from your kid. I bet he grows up to do great things. Pin in that because <laughs> this movie plays it out in the best fucking way ever. <laughs> Keep in mind, it's his dad who wrote it. Okay. Yeah. So and then the Tongan government kidnaps a British doctor and makes him work on Coley Pokey's kid. OK, <laughs> this actor deserves an Oscar for this performance because he has to be dragged down a hallway for 45 minutes doing the unhand me. What are you doing? I was on the plane. But it's so long. So, he, so he's a long. minute and a half into it. And he's just like, and another. Did I mention unhand me? Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Yeah, and they finally, after 45 minutes of this shit, they march him into this room and there's the sick baby and he, and, and he has a very like, oh, Jesus, I didn't realize it was a white baby. I'm okay. I'm on this kind of a creepy fucking moment, right? Or he didn't realize they needed him for medical care. So he was just like, oh, right. I'm a doctor, right? So yeah. <laughs> you guys could have told me on the plane I would have come. You didn't have to do the bouncer drink. Right, yeah. That didn't really make a hell of a lot of sense. But yes, yeah, so he teaches best worst doctor how to give a baby an IV which apparently was the the key to the whole thing through the butthole because the because the, the baby is now healthy and then like the next scene the baby's crying and 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 miserable which is a good thing yeah he was so weak he wasn't even crying yeah and what's amazing is this movie doesn't realize how irritating baby crying is because it's like blah, 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 throughout the entire scene and you can see the actors being like okay that's enough can the baby can, can we stop the, the can i hand oh. this baby to its actual mom or something? like a page and a half of dialogue left to do karen a page and a half of dialogue <laughs> And then there's this amazing moment. I love this moment so much. There's so much going on here, right? Because Sione's wife sees that the baby is okay. Now, the doctor that they kidnapped has already gone. He's gotten back to his plane, right? He's disappeared. Sione's wife looks over and he's like, hey, husband, your Catholic magic that you did on that baby worked. Look, it's it, it, the baby is fine now. Our God did turn out to be the best one. But just then, Totai wakes up. You know, and he's the one that had the Mormon magic yeah. done to him. Really wanted his first words to be, can someone shut that baby up? It's really irritating. <laughs> <laughs> but keep in mind, they've explained the Catholic magic away. It was actually a doctor showing up and leaving before Sione woke up. There was no explanation for it for Tootai. So that movie very clearly is like, yeah, they both used magic, but the Mormon magic won. That was, <laughs> that was the real. The Mormon was pure magic, that okay? Was, he didn't get a doctor's help. He really miracled that. Anyway, so yeah, so they're going to send mom and the baby off to America to fix the baby, right? 
Yep. And I feel like, because there's this moment where the daughters are like, Mom, I don't want you to go. And I'm like, is that because you've realized how fucked up it is to leave your other kids behind when the problem is inadequate medical care? (laughs) Oh, it is rough. Yeah. And again, invisible black lady is there. She like hands the baby to the woman and she gets on the plane. I just, I honestly, just like a see you when I get back, Cheryl. That's all I needed (laughs) to say. Yeah, right, right. So, yeah, so she leaves. Meanwhile, elsewhere in Tonga, some native baby is dying of diarrhea. Yep. And then we get another scene of Coley Pokey giving out mission assignments for his flock. Yep. This time he's going to send Nuku, that's the miracle mango tree baby from the first one, to the village where Totai came from, where Sioni lives. And they're going to finally have Mormonism in, in evil Catholic reverend's village. Yeah. And... He's sending Tuatai there as well. Yeah, yeah, to the guy that that buried him to his neck and left him in a storm to die. <laughs> and there's this great moment where he's like, hey, sorry, just, I know we're literally at the climax of the movie. I, I also hear the horn section. You sure about that? Do you want me to go back to the play? They beat the shit out of me. Literally, the last thing That's, they did was beat the... They okay, came, uh, well, else, now okay. I've got... Honestly, I almost died. I went brain... Got was, Nuku. Nuku, do you know karate? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an axe? No, he threw it in the ocean. Fuck. Oh, All right. Well, <laughs> so it goes well. Brought it back. All right. So, okay, we're getting to the wrap up. We promise. So we get, we cut to dad. He's wrapping up a bedtime story with another happy ending. Yeah. Call back. And, we, and then he writes a letter to his wife. Like the first movie He's like, hello, Gene. I know this isn't the first movie where it was sort of narrated through my letters, but remember? Remember? Letters? We did letters. It was now Send I'm writing that. you another letter. So, yeah, and, and Coley Pogey's letter, by the way, is fucking insane because he's like, yeah, you know, the voices in my head are telling me that I'm doing a great job here. So that's good. Yeah. And and then, oh, God, I love this little wrap up. He does this whole bit about it. he's like, you know, we almost lost our son, which no, you no, you fucking didn't. But no, you you, didn't. we almost lost our son really reminds you of what a huge sacrifice God made when he sent his only son, who is also him. To die for our sins, huh? Because uh, he was mad at us. He was himself. I, so he you killed us. Just his, stop being mad. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's such a weird. That look, my wife has these friends. They're very sweet, but if they get drunk enough, they do that. And I'm. I always say he could just stop being mad, and they're always so surprised and upset when I say. <laughs> but you could just. You could just stop. Hey, I don't care. All right, you know what? Come on up here, kiddo. We're going to throw some fucking aborted fetuses around. <laughs> Daddy's over it. <laughs> so, and then, okay. And then we we wrap the movie up for realsies this time with Tuotai and Nuku showing up in the village and helping dad do his dirt-related poverty work. Yeah. And then we get the breakfast club clothes. Yep, with the with the real photos of the real people these actors were portraying these breakfast club closes are so fucking funny so first of all right you expect bad dad minister his breakfast club close is going to be he became a mormon nope nope Still a fucking no. guy. yeah he didn't he made us tell you that he never changed religions <laughs> yeah in order to use his name we had to make sure that everybody knew he went to his deathbed as a catholic and then, of course, Bug Squisher, who was shoe- shoehorned in, has a, you know, he went on to be the president of Mormonism or whatever. But everybody else's breakfast club clothes is just so and so went on to be a normie. Yep. Right? There's, es- there's just nothing to say. Especially John, the baby who was saved that the president calls, your son is going to be a great man. And the guy heals him and he's like, I got the Caucasian magic from your son. He's going to be a great man. And his breakfast club clothes is like, John lives in Arizona with his family. Yes, Lovely. Yes. They have an above ground pool. <laughs> that's, that's it. Nothing about the daughters, by the way. We don't even hear their shit. Nothing, yeah. d- nothing about John's achievement in the breakfast club clothes is living in Arizona. <laughs> the end. And, and apparently his daughters did less or he cared less about <laughs> them. Yeah. All right. So and that's the end. Uh, would you like to take a stab at the moral of this story? Thank Jesus for Western medicine. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that's going to do it for our review of The Other Side of Heaven, too. But that's not going to do it for this episode just yet, because we still need to sucker ourselves into doing this again. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Well, Noah, we've got one last entry for Mormon Movie Month and just two more 
until our show catches up to the current timeline. See? Oh, crazy. It's a, yeah, it's a Doctor Strange tie-in. That's why we're gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> see, it all fits together. You guys thought we just needed a vacation. No. Mm. So we're going to be watching the, and I believe I'm right about this, Mormon cowboy murder mystery. What? Brigham City. They just we just saved all the other genres for the end of all Mormon the movie. Words, months, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so all right, with that to look forward to, we're gonna bring episode three eighteen to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to cut yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, the scathing aid, the citation needed D and D minus and the Skeptic Credit available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres Tim Robertson takes care of our social media our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotney we will dress on Mars all other music was written and performed by our audio engineer Morgan Clark and was used with permission thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week for Heath Enright Neil I Bosnick I'm no illusions promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week until then we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close Thomas Monson would go on to die embroiled in allegations that he enabled and covered up sexual abuse pretty much his entire career. Like so much, everybody. So much. Tonga would still rather have a nice hospital than Mormonism. Yep. Yep. You know, it just strikes to me to, as that we, but we, you know, remember we used to count to 10 and more yeah. than they, they only needed four and five. And he just let us keep going for so long between six and 10 until he just up and rebelled against him. Was that like what it used is? to do it. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> That's how I remember it. Do you think we could get away with two now? Like if we just did a one, two, what if, if I just, if I do one and then you do two, two. Yeah. We could, we could try how, that. how tight can we cut this? <laughs> Because those seconds added up, Morgan. Right. No, it was hundreds of episodes. Well, maybe not hundreds, but it was a lot of episodes. Anyway. <clears throat> you owe us eight and a half minutes, Morgan. <laughs> Motherfucker. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.